All right, well, good morning and welcome back. Certainly have uh, enjoyed these special sessions over the past three weeks and appreciate all of you coming and uh, the interaction and uh, the attention. It's just been, it's been enjoyable and trust it's been a, a benefit to you spiritually and as you learn the scripture. So I want to come to the last session today. Again, we've recorded all these. We have extra handouts. I am available for questions, as are your elders, anytime you want to talk about any of this material further. And just don't hesitate. Call us up, talk. We'll be happy to go over it and, uh, and talk through it. I do want you to turn this morning to 1 Timothy in the New Testament. I've given you a handout, and it has some of our scripture references on there, but we're going to look at several in 1 Timothy, even read a few together. Uh, so I want you to have your scriptures in front of you as we do that. 1 Timothy, and then I'll have a word of prayer. We'll get right into it. All right, let's give thanks to God. Father in heaven, thank you for your mercies towards us and the privilege of gathering together in Jesus' name and considering the mission and the government and the life of our church. And I pray you would teach us that these things would make sense and come together in our mind and even awaken more of a hunger for your word within us that we might search the scriptures to see uh, if these things are so and to have our faith built up. And I pray that you would give us wisdom that we would see the value of these things. We would see how these affect our Christian life for the good, how they nurture our souls and, and inspire our evangelism very means you've used to bring truth to a world which is desperately in need of truth and light and grace. And so guide us and teach us and thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So for the last time together, I want us to look at the idea of the government of the church. We've talked about the church in its nature, that it's a spiritual body, a spiritual organism created by the Lord Jesus Christ. He purchased it with his blood. He rose again to give it life. He has poured out his spirit that gathers the church, that goes out into all the world and calls out a people for the name of our Lord. As as people believe the gospel, they are brought into the church. They are baptized. We believe that along with the believing parents and heads of families comes the whole family, at least visibly, into the church. Thus, the church visibly is composed of all who profess Christianity together with their children. And that then within that visible assembly, God has given us worship and the scriptures and the means of grace in order to convert and build up sinners. And it doesn't stay inside the church. This is something we couldn't get to last week. But of course, it extends beyond the church as we as God's people are are sent out into the world at the end of every worship service to go and to make disciples, to live out our callings, to bring glory to God, and thus God from amongst our children and in bringing people in from outside builds his church. So if that's what the church is and if that's what the church is doing, then in order to accomplish that mission, there is a certain amount of structure that we need, and structure can be off-putting because we can think of it in terms of, of tightening everything up and kind of deadening everything and, and squeezing the life out of everything. Even in New Testament studies, some uh, see tension in the New Testament. In the book of Acts and 1 Corinthians, you've got this, this charismatic church where the Spirit's at work and, and, and everything is equal and everybody's participating. You go further into the New Testament, you get to these later letters and we're talking about bishops and deacons and, and structures and, and, and you know with, with the passing of this expectation that Jesus would come at any moment, well, we've got to tighten down and have structure in order to make sure that the church continues well. That, that, is, that is foreign to the unity of the scriptures. Uh, The work of the Spirit and the God-ordained structure can work together in a happy way. So there's a certain structure of the church as well as a certain authority of the church. And again, not authority in the sense that a a select few of us get to make up all the rules and you better obey us or it's not going to go well for you. But no, again, that, that shepherding, loving leadership that is for the health and guidance of the church. And when I say that, there are very important practical benefits 
in talking about the church's structure and authority. Just from a, from a practical standpoint, we, we do have to answer the question, what, what organizational structure does our church use? You know, who, who's in charge around here? Who, who gets to make decisions? What role do you as the people of God play in the government and in the health of your church? How do we relate to other churches? How do we relate to other PCA churches down the road? Yesterday, three of us went to Presbytery. Why do we have a Presbytery? Just so we can chew up two Saturday afternoons in the year? No, there's a little little more to it than just that. Uh, how do we relate to our other churches? How do we relate to other non-PCA churches? Within the church, how can we maximize our gifts and resources? <laughs> Any of you who work in business or run a business know that, that if there's not some structure, th- then resources are being wasted. Uh, You're not doing everything you could be doing. You're not maximizing your potential and your effectiveness. You, as the people of God, and the gifts that God gives this church, spiritually and materially, how how can we best use this for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom? And perhaps most importantly in all of this conversation, how, how do we keep leadership accountable? How do we keep elders and deacons holding to the word of God and rightly treating the people in their church. Maybe you've seen it or been in it, a church that has gone off the rails doctrinally, morally. It it, it has become a corrupt church. It abuses its people. It does not shepherd them and spiritually feed them with the word of God. Are they just left on their own? Is, Is there nothing that can be done in those situations? All of those questions relate to this issue of the government of the church. So let's consider it this morning. And first, let's look at the guidance for church government. What do we look to to answer some of the questions I've just given you? Three things they are on your sheet. First, we look to the scriptures. In all things, the holy scriptures are our final authority. The, the, in, the inspired, inerrant, infallible word are only and supreme rule for faith and practice. This is a legacy of the Protestant church. This is something that all Protestants hold in common. Uh, once I was a Baptist, and I would think about the uh, marks of what it means to be a Baptist. And you remember the acronym if you were Baptist? B-A-P-T-I-S-T. And what's the B stand for in that? Biblical authority. Now, I'm not picking on Baptists and bringing that up. I'm making the point that that is not unique to being a Baptist, that you believe in biblical authority, as if so now that you're in a PCA church, well, we'll, we'll put the Bible to the side and look at creeds and confessions. All Protestants hold this in common, that the scriptures are our final authority. And there's even good Baptist literature out there that would say, no, biblical authority is not the first unique mark of being a Baptist. That is held in common by all Protestants. And I just say all that to say that we take our stand on the scriptures, we read and preach them, and and we put them at the center of our life, because it's the only thing that never makes a mistake. It's the only reliable guide for truth. Even when there's areas in there we don't understand, we understand enough of it to know we can trust God. It will never err, whereas men and councils and confessions have and will err. Scriptures are our final authority. But secondly, we do also look at a confession of faith as a guide to what the scriptures teach. Here's where I'm going with this. We all believe the scriptures. We all say, what does the Bible say? That's a a great question that we often ask and answer. But we also have to answer the question, okay, what does the Bible mean when it says certain things? Okay, you believe the Bible, what do you think the Bible teaches? And the answer to that question will be in your confession of faith. Everybody that believes the Bible has a confession of faith, by the way. Every person in this room, whether you've thought a lot or a little about it, has an opinion on the Trinity, You have an opinion on Calvinism and Arminianism. You have an opinion on deacons and elders. We all have confessions of faith. Some confessions of faith are long. Some confessions of faith are short. Some confessions of faith are merely mental. Some confessions of faith are printed and thus made public for the church. Some confessions of faith are for the church, whereas in other places the confession of faith is just in the pastor's mind and he'll let you know exactly what you all ought to believe and do. In the Presbyterian Church, and this is not to toot our own horn, but we believe we should make our confessions of faith public. We should believe that you should have access to what this church believes and how this church functions. We therefore ask our office bearers as deacons and elders to hold to that and to abide by that and to enforce that in a proper way 
within the church. We believe that a confession of faith should be public, accessible, so everyone knows what it says. Furthermore, we believe that our confession of faith should be somewhat detailed. Some churches have a confession of faith that is short. You could print it on one piece of paper. Some people have a confession of faith that, that is extremely short. Some people have a longer confession of faith. We believe that's wiser. Why? Because one, there are certain things you must believe in order to be saved, in order to be, to be a Christian. And we want to make those clear. And if you want to join this church as a member, that's all we were really going to ask you about. Do you know the Lord? Why do you consider yourself a Christian? Are you walking in obedience to him? What evidence can you see in your life that you're born again? And if you can make a credible profession of faith, then we will add you to the membership of this church to fully partake of the Lord's table and to enjoy all the benefits of being a part of this body. But we do think there's more to what the Bible teaches than just what it takes to be saved. And we think that those truths in some way affect the gospel. They affect Christian living. They affect the life and the health of the church. And so therefore we articulate beyond fundamentals what we believe. And again, we have office bearers hold to those standards because the church follows those substandards as a guide to what we believe, to what we teach, and how we function. And you can read those in the Westminster Confession of Faith. That's what these that's what this acronym soup is here on number two. WCF is the Westminster Confession of Faith. WLC is the Westminster Larger Catechism. WSC is the Westminster Shorter Catechism. That, that will answer the question if you want to know what we believe. You don't have to know everything in there to be a member. You don't have to believe everything in there to be a member. You can be an Arminian and join this church. You can be a dispensationalist and join this church. You can reject infant baptism and join this church. What I will tell you, though, is, is what you read in the creed is what you'll hear preached and taught in this church. And, and, if, and if that is something that, that really causes a lot of trouble, then we say, okay, well, if you're a Baptist, perhaps this is a good option. Whereas if you can abide under this teaching, this is a good option. We, we want you to know what you're going to hear so that it's no surprise and so we can talk about it and grow in our understanding of it. So those are our substandards, our confession of faith. That answers the question, what do you think the Bible's all about? So then thirdly, getting now into church government, we also have a book of church order. And if you have trouble sleeping at night, I will be happy to get you a copy of the book of church order. It's long. It has three sections, the form of government, the rules of discipline, and the directory of public worship. It tries to flesh out some of those practical questions of, again, all right, if you're going to be an elder and a deacon, what do you have to do? If you're going to have a church, how do you organize it? If you're going to relate to other churches, how do you do that? Those questions just have to be answered. 1 Corinthians 14.40 says, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Um, many think that's every Presbyterian's life verse. And you can even get a coffee mug it says, predestined to be brewed decently and in order. Okay, so that <laughs> tells you what Presbyterians are all about. Can that, did we over-apply the verse? Possibly, that, that, that is certainly a possibility. But we think that Scripture gives us enough principles where we can try to flesh out a system of government that, again, is founded on the Word, that's agreeable to the Word. Not everything we do has a direct verse, but we're trying to implement the principles of Scripture in a way that is, that is orderly and good, and that, again, leads to the life of the church. So, so those are our standards. Scriptures, underneath the scriptures, the confession of faith, and then for the practical, functional question, the book of church order. Now, let's look into why, again, we have those things. Why do we take the scriptures and try to formulate confessions of faith and books of church order. First and foremost, again, because we believe that the scriptures give us the responsibility, the commandment even, to rightly govern the church and even to govern the church in this way. You, you've got your Bible open to 1 Timothy. Let me just give you a selection of verses so you can see uh, where we're coming from with some of this. 1 Timothy is Paul's letter to a young pastor who is in the town of Ephesus. And Paul's giving him some very good instruction. Look at chapter 1, verse 3. This is the main idea of the whole letter. Paul says, As I urged you, when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines 
any longer. A problem with false teaching in the church at Ephesus? Paul leaves Timothy there and says, straighten out the theology of the church. Teach people God's word so that the beliefs of the church are more in accordance with with divine truth. And if you were to read on through chapter 1, he talks a lot about the false teaching, how the gospel is the answer to it, how it should be implemented in the church. Skip ahead to chapter 2, verse 1. Paul there, coming into a new topic, says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Here's where he's entering uh, entering into giving some even more practical instructions. What should you do as a church? First thing he mentions, somewhat surprisingly, is is that there is prayer made on behalf of kings and all who are in authority, really that, that we pray for all kinds of people, that the church be a body that devotes itself to prayer. So there's instruction about the church's worship. Come into chapter three, verse one. Paul says, here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer or a bishop or a pastor or an elder, all those words are interchangeable in the New Testament. Whoever desires to be an overseer desires a noble task. And he goes on to give the qualifications. We'll read those together in a few moments. Look at verse 8. In the same way, deacons, dot, dot, dot. There follow the requirements for deacons. So within the church, Paul says, we're going to have officers, elders and deacons. And here are the qualifications for their office. Finally, look at verses 14 and 15 of chapter 3. Paul says, although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed... You will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. That, uh, that would be the purpose statement of the letter. I want you to know how the church should be governed. I want you to know how we ought to conduct ourselves in the household of God. Why? Because this is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Not that we originate truth, but this is the means whereby God spreads truth to his world. To, uh, to his world, through the church, proclaiming the word, proclaiming the gospel, organizing itself according to the word of God. If you were to read the rest of the letter, you would, you would read more uh, warnings against heresy, instructions on how to care for widows, and then just final instructions and charges. So, so we have the responsibility to take, take those principles and try to incorporate them into our church's life, and particularly our church's structure and our church's authority. So what then are the means of governing the church? What what have we devised in order to try to obey those scriptures and accomplish that mission? Let me give you three things in the time that we have left this morning. First, we have creeds and confessions. Now, we've already hinted at this a moment ago, but let me give you some scripture to kind of back up what we are saying. We, we want to articulate, again, what we think the Bible teaches. We think this is the best way to preserve truth in the church. I would remind you, you know this. Do Jehovah's Witnesses believe the Bible? Do, at least would they say they would? Absolutely. So much so they have their own translation. Do Jehovah's Witnesses believe the Trinity? No. Hence, their own translation. They would say, look, we believe the Bible. We think that the church as a whole has been hijacked by church tradition, by too many creeds. And so, therefore, we reject that church tradition, and we only believe the Bible. But then when you say, okay, well, what do you think the Bible says? We think the Bible denies that there's a trinity. We do not think Jesus is God in the same way that the Father is God. This is a heresy that was fought in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. This is why we have creeds like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene's Creed, to try to answer those heresies that were found to be in disagreement with the Word of God, and particularly disastrous when it comes to the issue of salvation, how you can enter into a right relationship with God through Christ. So creeds are not a way of, of circumventing or skirting the authority of the Bible. They're a necessary way of saying this is what we think the Bible teaches. And let me give you just a little bit of biblical evidence for the existence of creeds. You're still in 1 Timothy, probably still near chapter 3. Look at the very last verse, verse 16. Paul's just saying here, so I want you to conduct yourself in the church. Why? Because the church pro- publishes the truth. And then verse 16, 
He'll give an example of that truth. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Now, in the edition that I'm using, that verse is set in a different format from the rest of the text. Do do any of you have the same? Yes, I'm seeing lots of nodding heads. The reason it is set in a different typeface and and indentation is it is considered by most this is an early Christian creed. If you were to look at the structure in the original Greek, you would see more evidence for that. Parallel structures, similar meter, a, a particular scheme whereby it reads like a bullet point exposition of the gospel. Evidence in the scriptures for early formulations of what the inspired writers consider to be truth. Yes, this one's inspired by the scriptures, so it always helps if you have an inspired creed. But nonetheless, the idea of creeds was not foreign at all to the early New Testament church. Let me give you a little more evidence. 2 Timothy 1.13. I'll read it to you, or you're welcome to turn, because it's close by. 2 Timothy 1.13. And then we'll go right back to 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy 1.13, Paul says, What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Notice that there is sound teaching, truth, and there is a particular pattern of sound teaching. There is a way of expressing the truth. That, that highlights the nature of that truth. Not only are we to teach truth, not only are we to say, this is what the Bible says, we're also to articulate it in a certain word, form, pattern, saying, this is what the Bible teaches. And go back then one last time to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. 1 Timothy 1.10, Paul says, uh, jumping right into the middle of the sentence, what is the law for? For the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Again, notice the distinction that Paul makes between sound doctrine and and the truth itself. We've got the gospel, but then there's a sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel. There are particular teachings that are related to the gospel, and it is the minister and the church's responsibility to publish those. How do we rule certain beliefs and practices out of bounds, whether or not they conform to sound doctrine, and especially as that doctrine is related to the center, the gospel? There are patterns and forms and and publications that say this is truth, this is error, this is how it fleshes itself out, etc., etc. So creeds and confessions, we could look at more. Colossians 1, 15 to 20, another early Christian creed. Uh, I'll give you a resource at the end of today if you want to read more on that. But we believe that that creeds are not only permitted by the scriptures, we believe it's actually implicitly commanded that, that we formulate what we believe as the body of Christ. So we have creeds and confessions. Secondly, we have church officers. These are the men who represent the people of God and thus execute the government of the church, who who enact, who, who put into place the things that God has given us. We believe in two officers in the Presbyterian church, here listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3. First, we have elders. Let me read you. These seven verses, not going to make deep comments on, just want to read them so we can see that the idea of there being elders in the church and and, and qualifications for those elders is a very scriptural thing. First Timothy three, we read verse one. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? 
He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. If you also want to note Titus 1, 5 to 9, you have similar qualifications. And if you do by any chance look at the BCO, chapter 8 is where we spell out what we think these requirements are all about. Let me just read you one quote from Sean Lucas in his book about Presbyterianism. He writes, Elders have a number of duties, which include visiting people in their homes, caring for the sick, instructing the ignorant, comforting the mourner, nurturing the church's children, setting a spiritual example for the church, evangelizing the unconverted, and praying with and for people. To to the elders is given this awesome responsibility of, of governing the church, overseeing its spiritual health. Caring for the people within its bounds, praying for them, finding out if they know the Lord, encouraging in them and helping them when they're struggling, building those kinds of relationships in order to, to minister to them as an elder and an overseer, one who watches for their souls, able to teach as we read, therefore able to, to communicate the scriptures and to teach the church's doctrine. doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be any, any particular fantastic, amazing thing, but, but faithful to the scriptures with a love for the people within its bounds, watching for their souls. Within Presbyterianism, by the way, we do distinguish between ruling and teaching elders. This church has one teaching elder and five ruling elders, for which I'm very grateful. Uh, I don't have the situation where I have to do my job alone. I have five men who can help me in that. So so plenty of ways to spread around the blame, right? Uh, In all seriousness, six men who are are here in this church to pray for you and, and to care for you and to build a relationship with you. One who is designated to do most of the teaching, that is my job, and to administer the sacraments. But all of us to represent you and to care for you and to watch for your soul. A wonderful position to be. But secondly, and no less importantly, we have the office of deacon. Let's read verses 8 through 13. In the same way, Paul writes, deacons are to be worthy of respect. Sincere, not indulging in much wine and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women, usually interpreted as the wives of the deacons, are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Deacons have the wonderful privilege and responsibility of overseeing the ministries of mercy and benevolence. You can read about this in BCO chapter 9. Again, let me just read you a quote. From Sean Lucas. He says the deacon's responsibilities of stewardship and service include ministering to those in need, the sick, the friendless, and to any in distress. Deacons also seek to develop the grace of liberality. See, you knew Presbyterians were all liberal. Liberality there in the sense of generosity. Now, deacons develop the grace of generosity in the members of the church, devising means for collecting the gifts of the people and for distributing, distributing the benevolences of the church. In addition, they have oversight of the church's property, seeking to maintain it properly. On the Sunday I visited here 15 months ago to preach the one time before you had a congregational meeting, I, I met with the elders and I also met with the deacons. And I told every one of them, you are spiritual men. And and to you has been given the wonderful spiritual benefit of caring for those in need in this church and encouraging charity and generosity. I told him, my view is I don't view deacons as a lower office. Okay, the elders do the spiritual stuff, figure out what everybody else needs to do, and then the deacons just do all the work around the church. We, We look at both offices as spiritual men doing a spiritual work. One for the care of souls, the other for the more immediate care of their bodies or emotional needs, needs of comfort and friendship, what have you. I think it's very interesting that that the BCO lists care of the property last. Our deacons do an amazing job 
caring for the property, and we are incredibly grateful for them. But we don't view them as just you're the brick and mortar people. You're just the workers in the church, spiritual men doing a wonderful work to encourage generosity and care and mercy and also caring for the property within our midst. And and I take a moment to say all that because we are in the midst of deacon nominations. And as you pray about those to nominate or if you've been approached to, to take this and to pray about it carefully and to consider if God would give you these gifts. This burden, if he's calling you into this sacred and and wonderful office. So the elders and the deacons take the scriptures and the confession and the book of church order, and and we implement it in the church. We, We follow those standards in order to do the work of the church. Deacons and elders are all called by the people. That is your privilege and responsibility to elect those who will represent you and serve you, and have a say over who will fill that office, and also yourself, perhaps, in the will of God, to serve in one of those offices as well. Thirdly, then, and lastly, stop me if there's any questions, but otherwise I'll move on to the third thing. How do churches uh, implement our vision, our mission, the gospel, etc.? Thirdly, with the use of church courts. One of the unique features of Presbyterianism is it implements a graded system of church courts, and graded meaning going up in various levels of appeal. First and foremost, and most central, I believe, to the life of this church, is the work of the church session. The ruling elders and the teaching elders of a church sit together uh, in a church court called a session, as we said, overseeing the life of of the church spiritually. Authority, uh, or at least description of this office, comes from Matthew 16. I think I've given you this reference on your handout. There's some things in this verse that may not make sense at first reading. and I can't go really far into depth this time. We'll look at all these over time. But just follow some of the main ideas from Matthew 16. Jesus says to Peter, I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, either referring to Peter's confession of faith, or Peter as he represents the elders. Both of those are acceptable. Neither of those lead to the office of the papacy. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you, plural, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Notice this. We're talking a lot on Sunday mornings about the coming of the kingdom. Jesus is here saying that within the church during this age, he will execute the authority of his kingdom. Who will have the responsibility of executing or at least of representing that authority? Peter and the other apostles, and we tie the office of elder to them. We believe that the elders of the church are the descendants of those apostles. We're not apostles ourselves, but the authority to oversee the church is given to the elders of the church, the pastors and to the teachers. And what do those elders do? They loose and they bind. And this in the scriptures is language that refers to sins, that elders have the authority and responsibility of either loosing people's sins from them or binding people's sins to them. And this is where you say, okay, I knew it was going to get weird in week three. What is he talking about? Ministers have the responsibility to take the scriptures and declare to the people of God what God says and what God doesn't say. First and foremost, that relates to your own relationship with God. Here is what God says you must do in order to be saved. It is the elder's job to evaluate that, to know the scriptures so well ourselves that we can hear what you're saying and say, guess what? You got it right or you got it wrong. If you got it right, you rightly understand what God has told you you must do in order to be saved. Guess what? We can tell you with heaven's authority, your sins are loose from you. You say, that, that's, that's deriving my assurance of salvation from a man. No, it's not. It's deriving your assurance from God's word, which is our responsibility to give to you. To hear what you say and to say, I have good news. You, you have believed what the scriptures have told you. And we want to declare publicly to the world that, that you are a member of Christ's church. You've made a credible profession of faith. And as the scriptures declare, whosoever believes in me will be saved. Your sins are loosed from you. All right, that's not your only grounds of assurance. You have the Holy Spirit, you have the scriptures, but guess what? That should count for something, that we are not all on our own. 
That the church is not just a building we come to. That the elders aren't just guys meeting trying to figure out all the things we need to do. That we're here to care for your soul. To assure you of God's favor as it is based on the word of God. And sadly, when necessary, to do the opposite. If folks stray into sin or into heresy and invalidate their confession with their life, that we would say, we we warn you in God's name, we believe your sins are still attached to you. We're, We're just trying to declare heaven's declaration to the people of God. Same statement then, let me just read these statements from John that communicate the same idea. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus is acting out what will happen in 50 days on the day of Pentecost. And the Spirit will be given to these apostles and elders. Why? If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Again, the declarative authority of the church that God will use his elders to announce heaven's truth to the people of God. Do we err? Yes. We can make mistakes and we can be fooled. The authority of the church is far from infallible, but it is given in order to proclaim the truth. That's why I say it should count for something in an encouraging way as well as in a sobering way. Before I look at these last two, we are running to the very end of our time. Do you want to ask any questions on that? All right, good. Let let that just... Put a crock pot in your mind. Let that just cook in there for a little while, okay? And then you can come back and and we can talk more. I can't go to Acts 15 as much as I would like to, but the second layer of authority is the presbytery. Let me just list these for you, and we can always dive back in at a later time if need be. If you were to go home and read Acts 15, and go ahead and read on into chapter 16, the first five verses there, here's what you would find. A doctrinal controversy erupts in the church. Some people come down, supposedly with the authority of Jerusalem, and say, if you're not circumcised and you don't keep the law of Moses, you can't be saved. We have false teaching in the church on how to be saved. The apostles uh, and elder, or Paul and Barnabas, are appointed, keyword, to go up to Jerusalem and meet with the apostles and elders and deliberate and settle the question. They meet. They discuss, they cite the scriptures, they come to this conclusion, Gentiles are saved in the same way as we are. None of us could keep the law of Moses and be saved. We won't put that burden on Gentiles either. Salvation for all is by faith alone and Christ alone. They write up a letter declaring that, and then they give it to the apostles and elders and say, distribute this through the churches and command them to keep it. I will read you that verse from Acts 16.4. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the church was strengthened and grew daily in numbers. We have a presbytery as a second layer, a second court, to oversee the work of the church in a particular area. So that if there are doctrinal disputes that cannot be solved within a church, they can be solved by the gathered church, by the church as represented by its pastors and its elders. This is not a second layer of authority imposed on you as if, okay, we have our church, but there's some other guy who will argue for us in Presbytery. I go to Presbytery. Your elders go to Presbytery. E.L. and Rick both went with me yesterday. So that when the church is gathered, it's the same people that you elected representing you, arguing on your behalf and doing the work of the church in a region. Here's the good news. If there's a problem here, maybe just something we just can't figure out and we just need help, we can appeal to a Presbytery. If you have been wronged, if this church session makes a, makes a decision that, that, that wrongs you, that harms you, that violates the word of God, you can appeal to the presbytery. If your pastor goes off the rails somehow and you're like, we have got to get this guy out of here, you, you can appeal to the presbytery. All right? If your church mistreats you, the presbytery is there as your ground of appeal. If you mistreat me, the presbytery is there uh, as my ground of appeal. But we know that's never going to happen. Uh, it, it is there for your protection and for your health and for the good of of the church. So that then lastly, finally, and I'll conclude on this, you do also have the general assembly, the highest court, that which can represent all the churches within the PCA. And again, guess who goes to GA? 
I go to GA. All these elders are welcome to go to GA anytime they want to go to, to represent Roba Press on, on the national level so that your church has a real part in the whole church and the whole church is represented here at Roba Press. I've given you at the end further reading. If you want to do some digging deeply on this in the confession or the book of church order or books, those are there for you. I have most of them and can loan them to you or help you get a copy of them. We do need to break. Uh, any questions you want to ask before we go? Otherwise, we'll close in prayer. Great. I enjoyed it, and I really appreciate your good intention. We'll keep thinking about these things as we continue. Father in heaven, how grateful we are for your...